Wonderful, thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Transplant Home Best Practice webinar. Some meeting reminders, please mute your lines when you're not speaking to avoid any background noise. Uh, be present and engaged. We encourage um, asking questions. Whether you raise your hand to ask a question or you put it in the chat, we'll, um, we will address the questions uh, when we take breaks. And then all meeting materials that we discussed today will are available um, in iProLearn or the network program website. And this presentation is being recorded and we will be sending out the recording um, shortly after the presentation is complete. Today's agenda, um, the meeting reminders, which we just went over, we're going to talk about transplant interventions first that we've done in the network over the past few months. We do have a guest speaker for transplant. We are going to talk about home modality interventions. We have a guest speaker for home and then closing remarks. All right, so waitlist and transplant CMS goals and network interventions. Um, I'm going to be presenting this section. Of, um, um, the project manager for quality improvement for transplant for all four networks. On this slide, you can see the, um, the goals for transplantation, um, increasing waitlist and increasing transplant are the two QA goals. The performance goal for 2021. 2022 is a 2% increase for increasing waitlist and increasing transplant. This year will be ending at the end of April of 2022. So in the past three months, the network released the following resources to help facilities improve upon their quality improvement activities. The NCC transplant change package is pictured on the far left-hand side of the screen. This change packet is a collection of best practices from high performing facilities across the nation. This package includes interventions that facilities can use to implement change within their facilities. If you haven't viewed this package yet, I highly encourage you to do so via iProLearn and share with other members of your interdisciplinary team. The second resource is our help with HIPAA guide that gives a brief overview of HIPAA law, as well as how to incorporate patients into monthly QAPI meetings and celebrate transplant success while maintaining HIPAA compliance. Networks were required to explore the new health literacy toolkit that is housed in iProLearn. This provides education about health, about health literacy and how it can impact a patient's desire to consider transplant or be successful, successful throughout the transplant workup. Within this toolkit, the first of many resources that will be released is the Realm SF score sheet, which is a very quick and simple way to screen your patients for low health literacy. Lastly, we shared our reevaluation algorithms with our community coalition. These algorithms are meant to be used for those patients whose transplant referrals were closed either due to medical or non medical reasons. This tool can be used by the dialysis facilities to find the next steps to take in the patient's journey to transplant. Due to a large increase of waitlist referrals that are being sent to transplant facilities across all four networks, this tool will be shared again um, in the coming months. In the past few months, the network also has shared these following resources with facilities to be used with patients. First, turn Negatives into positives is a great resource from the NCC that your PFR or other highly engaged patients can use to discuss transplant with other patients who are considering that modality. We have a beginner level treatment modality brochure that discusses many options with an emphasis on kidney transplantation. The I choose Emory kidney risk calculator was shared as well, which is a nice tool where patients can enter their demographic data and other dialysis treatment information and the calculator tells you your one and three year mortality risks with staying on dialysis, getting a living donation or giving a or getting a deceased donation. And lastly, we shared the network's transplant workup appointment checklist to aid in the time and process from waitlist to referral by having a tool that patients can take to work up appointments and check off completed tasks. This tool also includes a glossary of commonly used words that patients may hear when they're at these appointments. On this slide, I wanted to review some iProLearn feedback that we received 
throughout some of our interventions for the past few months. First, we did share the most recent best practice call that we did in November of 2021. This was shared with the network. We did have 840 facilities view this recording who didn't attend the live viewing. 85% stated that they believe the information presented was helpful in promoting transplant, and 82% stated that they would share the information gathered. The presented interventions to incorporate were increasing communication with dialysis facilities and using more educational material to discuss with patients. The second feedback um, intervention that I wanted to discuss was more recently the transportation discussion post that uh, we had posted on iProLearn. That was in the discussion forum for QIA. We had 118 responses across all four networks. Uh, transportation is an ongoing concern in all four networks, and it is gonna, going to continue to be an ongoing discussion for health equity purposes. Some best practices that came out of these transportation responses, uh, facilities were talking about how they encourage patient autonomy in making their own appointments um, after obviously assisting them and showing them how to do it. Trans or uh, dialysis facilities work with transplant centers to consolidate appointments and use telehealth when possible. So it avoids the patient from needing to travel to and from the transplant center, especially if they live further away. And third, use family support, exploring reimbursement for a family that drives patients to these appointments and also church and faith groups. Things to come in transplant as far as interventions and education. Here at the network, we're gonna further our work in health literacy and health equity. We're going to provide uh, we're going to provide education on CMS goals and incentives, and we are we are also going to provide education on streamlining referrals and improving communications with your transplant centers. Um, I do want to add, if there's ever an area of interest that you think we should explore as a network, um, we encourage you to reach out to us to discuss collaboration. All right, so we do have a transplant best practice speaker, um, Aaron Timms, who's an outreach coordinator at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. And so I'll turn it over to her. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. All right, perfect. Well, I was asked here today to talk about, you know, really like how could we be more efficient, right? How can we get everybody from referral to wait list? What do I do as an outreach coordinator at UC? to help facilitate these referrals and the process itself. Um, so we're gonna go through somewhat what I'm gonna call kind of a how-to guide for every step of our process. So next, please. Thanks. So this just says um, obviously who I am and my position. Um, I started about five years ago here at the University of Cincinnati um, doing some pre and some post work, but then ended up doing this outreach coordination coordinator position. Next, please. All right. So when I talk with everybody, um, you know, I always tell them that this whole thing is a process. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Okay. So we're going to go through the each freight or each phase um, as we call it here at UC. I know that's another problem that we have that dialysis units and their software call them different um, uh, phases, but this is what we call them here at UC. So we're going to start and go through referral, evaluation, waitlist, and then obviously transplanted. Next, please. Next. So here's the referral phase. So when I go out to talk with dialysis units, when I meet patients, I really want help from the social workers trying to get our patients established with a primary care, um, established with a dentist. I talk to many patients who um, you know, haven't ever been to the dentist, um, especially um, those that need a lot of dental work. So these are things that we've seen as a transplant group holds up evaluation. 
um, because our insurance um, providers need dental clearance from our patients. So these two things, getting a primary care, getting established with them, getting the appointment to begin with, seeing them, um, and the same thing with the dentist are really important. And these are things that honestly, in the scheme of things, if we're advocating for the patient and their health, these are things that we need to do. And I know we've all heard this, but I think it's a good thing to go over. The next thing is the health maintenance that goes along with having a primary care. Um, I, it's a lot of words there. I did want to go through the colonoscopy, the mammogram, the pap smear, and then vaccinations. Um, colonoscopy, they've changed regulations to 45 and up now. Um, mammograms 40 years and over for females. Pap smears are over the age of 18 unless they've had a total hysterectomy. So a lot of people have had a partial, but they definitely need a total, which means their cervix has been taken out. So those three are there. Then with vaccinations, we do want to let everybody know that as of February 1st here at UC Health, we are mandating the COVID-19 vaccination. Um, that's either one of Johnson & Johnson or one and two of Pfizer or Moderna. We are not um, uh, mandating the boosters at this time, um, but this was a decision made by the team. So just so you're aware. Now, caveat to that. When we call the patient, if they are absolutely unwilling, don't even want education about it, then that's where we're not going to accept their referral. Going, going forward, though, if they're interested in at least talking with a provider, that's fantastic. We want to talk with them. We want to see if there are questions that we can answer and help them feel better about the decision towards vaccination. So just a little bit more on that. Um, this is not carte blanche. No. Um, but we do want to see if the patients want to come in and talk with us. So we go to the next slide, please. So this is a chart, this slide and the next slide are um, the charts of the other vaccinations. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, like Caroline said, these are going to be available on that IPR Oh, learn. And those of you that know me, and I can even put my email in the chat box, I can send this out to you so that you're aware. These are things that we work on with the patients during evaluation. So, again, this is not something they have to have prior. Um, these are things that we need them, though, to work on during um, their evaluation process. So, if you can go to the next slide, again, just some more that are on there with your fine. <laughs> <Keep going. laughs> So this next part, again, is still in the referral phase. We, when we see these patients for evaluation, in order to be efficient and try and get these patients to waitlist, which is what all of our goals are, we really need these patients to be aware of what they've had done in the past. You know, we'll have somebody like, where'd you get your colonoscopy? Well, I had it a year ago, but I think it was at Miami Valley, but I'm not sure. I think it was this. We call Miami Valley and find out it was an EGD. <laughs> and so that actually happened today. We we're kind of giggling about that. So again, we know that patients aren't fully educated and understand all the terms. And I know that's very confusing, but the better that we can help our patients know what they've had done already, and they can sit down and make a record of this and bring it with them, that would be huge. Same thing with their medications. There are a lot of patients that don't know what they're taking day to day, and that, that's obviously a huge part of their evaluation. Um, and then identifying the health screenings, again, same thing, echocardiogram, stress test, a two-view chest x-ray. Again, the more these patients know, and we have some really good historians, but we have a lot that are poor historians, and we all know that. The more we can help them get those written down, the better and, and the more efficient we can be through the evaluation process. Um, the last one, of course, we always want everybody to talk about talk with their family or their friends about their support, um, especially from an outreach coordinator position where I see patients out in the Dayton area. I go out to Lexington and Louisville. I want these patients to understand that absolutely we want you to come to Cincinnati, but you do need to travel and you do need to make sure that your team, your support team and yourself are committed to getting you back and forth to be the most successful candidate you can be. And we understand, I think Caroline even talked about, that was one thing that I know has been a top, hot topic has been the distance and the travel and the ability, the transportation to get patients there. So we're absolutely aware and we are doing the best that we can at this time to, to help out with that as well. Next, please. So that's Dr. Cuffey, one of our surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> but during the evaluation process, so we were talking about the referral phase. For me, I'm trying to be 
as pre as possible, right? How well can we get these patients ready to even see us in evaluation? So if they can get all their records and their medications and they know where they've gotten their testing and they have a primary care and a dentist, then we're off to the races with evaluation, okay? So every transplant center has some kind of education program. Now we used to have an in-person program, we've switched to video, was a great way anyway because of COVID, right? We couldn't see a lot of patients. So this is our mandatory video um, that all patients know of when they get um, scheduled. They're given a link. Um, we try to send them out in emails if it helps. Um, we obviously help people throughout the process if we need to resend the link. But for those of you that are interested, this is a great tool for any staffers, um, for family, for patients who don't even know if they're ready for transplant. Okay, so this doesn't just have to stay with people who are in the system. We want everybody to watch this. It's free. It's on YouTube. It's about an hour long. It's got great information about UC Health and our, our transplant way. So that little scan me code should work. If anybody's interested, there's that. So next, please. Um, just so you're aware, like I talked about, I do the outreach clinics with Dr. Goble, our head transplant nephrologist, and these are a listing of the places where we see patients out further. We're trying to see them closer to home. What we want to do is meet them and see what kind of things do they have? Do they have restrictions on their transportation? Do they have support issues? Are the things we can work on now before we bring them all the way into Cincinnati to meet the rest of the team? So that's what that is. And then, of course, the UCMC is, is the Clifton campus, the main um, evaluation um, appointment. Next, please. So during evaluation, we start talking to patients about trying to find a living donor. So we obviously send them a, a living donor link, and that's what's there with that QR, oak, QR code. And then we want patients to share their story. And I know I talk with a lot of patients who just are like, I, I can't, I can't, you know, and, and I tell them, I want to make them laugh. I tell them, well, we don't just walk up to somebody and say, hey, can I have your kidney? <laughs> we have to come up with a way to share our story. How does dialysis feel? What does your family look like? What are the things that you're looking forward to doing? Um, and you need to share that, right? And if you feel like you can't, or you feel that you've got somebody in your family who would be a great kidney champion, even better, somebody who'd be an advocate to spread the word and share your story. So that's what that kidney champion is about there. Um, next. So this is actually Dr. Shaw, one of our other surgeons. Next. We're going to talk about once you're on our wait list. So this is something that I know on other calls, um, Jen, our clinical um, manager, has talked about. They're called the microsites, and they're in partnership with the National Kidney Registry, which is the, the registry that we're a part of to do our kidney swaps. Um, and they have started these microsites, which are wonderful. So these are free, personalized websites, just like it says, designed to help candidates um, find a living donor, okay? So the phases there are there. You get registered, you get to sign the HIPAA, just so you're aware that you are sharing your information. Um, once you get a starter site activated, you're sent these in the this um, kidney, national kidney registry um, business card, which is in the lower right-hand corner. Um, and it would have your specific URL site, and you'd be able to hand those out. And it would take you to this site. So if you go to the next slide, so this is an example. So um, this it would have a picture of you. You would share your story. You would share why you need your kidney. And then there's a portion, a part where you could put more pictures, family pictures, grandkids, children, things like that, the things that you want to do. Um, and on the bottom of the page is this red box at the bottom where it says you can learn more about becoming a living donor, even if it's not for this person specifically, just understanding what it is. And then actually registering to donate for this specific person. So these these microsites are amazing. Um, we have been doing these now, I think, for two years. Don't don't quote me on that time, um, but they've really gotten a push, and the National Kidney Registry has seen a lot of success with these. And so uh, we are definitely um, definitely doing these for our patients. Um, next, please. So, oh, sorry, this didn't come out very well. I just wanted to show with this that every step of the way builds on the next step. OK, and just because you may not have known who your doctor was at the very beginning, once I see you in evaluation, I'm going to ask you again. So we build on these. So my point to this is that the more that we know at the beginning, the more efficient and hopefully quicker we can get to where we're going. The more we know at the beginning, the less we have to dig and find as we go. And then the more time that you have to look for a living donor. 
the more more time that we're just getting through the process. So that's what I wanted to show here. The referral, having your history, having your maintenance already done, the evaluation part committing to the process. That means making sure you've got that support, sharing your story, trying to find a living donor. And then while in the wait list, continuing to look for that living donation um, and, and to have hope. I mean, this, this is why we're here. We're here to help people get to that transplant. So next, please. So, does anybody have any questions? I do have a comment here in the chat. Um, it's not a question, but it is a comment, and it is um, could be a best practice for the the audience. It says, um, "Dental clearance is an obstacle as many insurance plans do not cover dental work." Um, this, the, whoever has submitted, said, "I have tried referring to dental schools and colleges for reduced dental work fees." So that could be a good um, solution if your patient doesn't have dental coverage. Absolutely, and that's what I know that um, we have a great relationship with our dental school as well. And I think that's a really great place to go, especially for those people who don't have insurance and it's not covered. Um, I ran into a patient a few weeks ago who for the last two years has needed multiple um, extractions and just hasn't done it because obviously it was just a burden on them financially. Um, we were able to get them hooked up with our dental school here and he's going back to see um, what, what they can do for him. So absolutely, I, I, I don't disagree. It's something that we have to work on um, and it's expensive. I guess the, the point then to that is the hope is that you continue to see the dentist and you've been seeing them for a long time, right? So you can continue so things don't get so out of control that then we have to pull teeth. But we understand that that there are people that are in that situation and we have to work with that. I, also, uh, I just I had a comment about the dental. Um, I've also heard that there's certain um, you know community uh, health care organizations that you know treat Medicaid patients that will offer dental services. So uh, they, if, if you look, not all do, but if you look in your state and you check your community, they're usually like a community health partnership or something like that. Your, your local kind of clinics may have dental services in them for your um, Medicaid patients. So there's another suggestion with that. Sorry, Ramona. Oh, that's quite all right. I have a question. So my question, is regarding the transportation. Now, are they are having issues getting to the initial visitation or are they having trouble when it after transplant and they're having trouble getting back and forth to clinic? So I, I think we've seen it all, right? So I have definitely seen people who can't even get to me. Right, so their insurance is saying that they will pick them up and they don't, or they're they're having, you know, a month ago it was too many pay, uh, too many drivers had COVID, right? So they just did not have enough. Um, I've definitely seen people who once I tell them that even though they wouldn't be doing dialysis anymore, that they still have to continue to come back and forth to Cincinnati. Those we have to do we do Monday and Fridays for the first four to six weeks as patients recover. Um, they are very hesitant because they worry that they can't do that. In that first month, that patient can't drive if they were able to to begin with because they're on medication and they have stitches and all that good stuff. Um, so I I think it's all of it. I I, that, I don't know that there's one versus another. Um, obviously, if they can't even get to see me, then then that shows that they probably can't get to the other ones. When they do get to see me, I always want to make sure that again that they're talking with their support team and that this the support team understands the commitment that they will need to help get them back and forth. If, if that's the situation, I know insurance can obviously be planned. Like once they um, are admitted, get the transplant, then we can set up all of those rides. But the problem is. Not everything we know 24, 48 or 72 hours before they need to be with us, right? And insurance tends to have that caveat that you have to call them ahead of time to schedule. Sometimes you need a biopsy and you need to come in the next day, right? Or so, something is not going as well as it should. Um, so that's where we kind of get into that. Um, but again, I just want to make everybody aware that they need to talk with their support plan, right? They need to make sure that they understand that. Does that help? Well well, this is why I asked because we do a lot of, I do a lot of transplant education in the clinic. Mm -hmm. And for me, I need the information as far as, okay, so the first four, the first four weeks, this is what you're going to be looking at. So that when I'm telling them, they need to go home and, and convey this to like their partners or whatever saying, okay, I'm going to need to make sure I have transportation back and forth on Mondays or Fridays, whatever their clinic day is. Because for me, the more information that I share with them, 
And right. you know me, so you know, I, I'm telling them everything I find out. Like this is what right. we need, so that they're right. prepared. I don't even send them down there without letting them know ahead of time. Hey, it's going to be a few hours. They're going to introduce you, and you're going to, you know, I give, I prepare them, and I'm letting them know ahead of time so that we're not wasting each other's time. Right, and we want them you to know, be as successful as possible, right? So if they can have exactly. the conversation and maybe that exactly. first conversation doesn't go so well, but maybe they approach it in, in another couple of weeks and the person kind of warms up to it and understands it's a little bit more, maybe they watch the video and they understand, you know, the commitment, because exactly. it is a commitment, right? And I think some people, I get a lot of people who misunderstand, they think they're still going to dialysis and coming to see us, right? And right. Because a lot of patients don't understand that our surgeons will tell us that, that the kidney was making urine on the table, right? It was, it was as soon as it got a blood supply, it was working. And so there, it's a lot of education about why does that look like it? And I really appreciate that, that you're, you're doing all these things beforehand. Um, I know that when I see them, I, that is like my number one, do we, are we sure? <laughs> Especially again, since I'm even out further than you are, Ramona, right? You're you're not that bad, but I see people that are two hours away, right? Right. right. And I want to yes. make sure that they understand that no, unfortunately, I don't come out to Lexington to do the surgeries. No, you won't have post care in Lexington, right? Um, just to make sure that that they're aware. But that's an abs absolute point: is the more information and the more education we can do beforehand, which is goes along with all those other things. The more prepared they are, and we're not we're not putting them up against something that they can't fix, right? Some people just don't have the transportation. They just don't, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. I do have a question regarding microsites, if you have the answers for them. Um, does I'll your try. transplant center, <laughs> okay. Did you, is it like a, your transplant center has a, a, a contract to do the microsites or can someone just log in and create a profile? Um, so that's one a of the question. questions is that, Right, so that's a good question. So any center um, that has a partnership with the National Kidney Registry is able to use those microsites. So it's not just us, right? So it's any center. So I don't, I, honestly, I couldn't tell you what the other ones are and that's my fault. Um, once you're put on that center's wait list, if they are ones that are in relationship with the National Kidney Registry, because there are other swap systems across the country, um, then the microsites become available. Well, we, what I understand um, is that, again, it's once they've been waitlisted, so we know that they're a candidate, because if we were to do the microsites beforehand, then we would be generating a lot more um, possible donors when we're not quite sure for a candidate, right? And the microsites seem to reach a lot of people. Um, but I think it's a great thing to kind of go to the point of, can you only use it if you're NKR kind of thing, which I think is yes, because it's an NKR product. What I think maybe that pushes to everybody else is that maybe we need to figure out how to do this system for everybody. Uh, I, I don't I don't know the, the answer to that. Does that make sense? But it's not a UC specific okay. product. It's an NKR. And since we are partnered with the NKR, then our um, patients are able to use them. There are some comparable sites. Um, the National Kidney Foundation has the Big Ask Big Give site, and you can post your story. It's not as sophisticated as NKR, where they're going to actually like accept the donation there. Or there's sites where you can just put your story out and build your story, so people at least hear about it. But then they probably have some connection back to you or somewhere else to figure out how to offer their kidney. Whereas the NKR is like an all in one. You hear about the person, you can ask about living donation, you can learn about living donation, you can sign up to be a donor. You know, it's all in one because that's what they do. NKR is a package. Right. And we have to uh, not forget that, like, even Facebook. You know, social media period, if you can put a little blurb and some pictures in the links of the centers to which you are affiliated, right? Because we hope people are multi-listed. I mean, I'm sorry, the more the merrier, right? Um, that you can put that. It's amazing how people who maybe don't feel that that's a, a route for them, right? I don't want to be a living donor, but I want to share, I want to help share their story, right? And that's how we end up making those circles and getting things like someone in California saw it. It's, it's amazing what that can do. So we have to keep that in mind too. Social media is huge and we need to use that as well. Yeah, I think the power of a person's story has been really well documented for living. Absolutely. Donation. Might not be as sophisticated as the microsite, but there's, like you said, social media, there's- Right. There's- uh, Any, any, any sharing is good sharing. Awesome. Um, I saw 
if there's no other questions, there is nothing else in chat that I see. So we can advance to Can I make the, one more um, next question, Caroline? Um, I did see a I was asking um, I was asking Aaron about the other vaccines like um, the zoster vaccine. Do you require influenza and zoster and or is it just recommended for your transplant? Wait, so the chart is on there. Um, it's on there. I'd have to read through it. I don't deal with patients who are at that point where we have to make sure everything is checked off. Um, from what I understand, it's highly recommended. Okay. Um, but I don't think we have anything specifically mandated. But again, that chart is there. If anybody needs it, it's on that IPRO learn so they can look through it and see. I'm sorry. I don't. I honestly go ahead. Is it, but COVID is a required and that's the COVID is correct. So John, one of Johnson and Johnson or two of the Pfizer or Moderna, not the booster though. We're not mandating the booster at this point. And the way I understand it, Aaron, is that almost every transplant center out there is requiring COVID because the transplant patients suffered so greatly with COVID infections because they correct. don't build immunity after transplant. Right. So this is right. And, and that's what we try to remember the patients that are worried about getting it is that. I, they forget, though, that their lives change after transplant, that they are becoming immunosuppressed, even more so than what just their comorbidities have done for them. And we remind them that that we are purposely taking away your defense shield to keep that kidney happy. And in order to make sure you have the most protection that you can, and COVID is not a good thing for transplanted patients. And, and again, we have seen that over the last few years um, that we believe this is the best plan to, for their success, for them to stay happy through, or happy, sorry, healthy and happy throughout this process. So, yeah, that's that was an important, because at first I, I think they, everybody know, and now they've seen the effects of COVID right. and that vaccination People build immunity before transplant, but after transplant, very low building of the immunity to COVID. Right, and that's the other thing. I think the difference between getting it after really didn't help as much, and the benefit was having it prior to transplant. And I really believe that that was the push for the team to to move to the man the mandate. And you're right. Most of I, I don't have a number. I have not heard of really anybody that isn't doing this, but I, I could be wrong about that. Dialysis facilities don't require it, but transplant centers for waitlisting are requiring it. Wonderful. Okay, we will move forward to the home modality presentation. If anyone has questions in regards to transplant, we'll address them at the end of the presentation if you put them into chat. Thank you. Well, thanks, Aaron. That was a wonderful presentation and Carolyn refreshing us on all the transplant. Um, we're going to move on to discussing um, empowering patients to choose a home modality. And so, like we did before, I just want to share with you what uh, you know CMS is looking for in terms of home modalities um, improvements uh, and as well as what we're doing at the network level to try to help you get tools and resources to continue to move your patients to home. Slide, please. Or do I have the ball? Oh, you, you the ball. do have the ball. Thank you. All right. So here's the goals. I mean, CMS um, has really is looking at trying to align, you know, that home population. You know, industrial countries out there have a much higher prevalence of patients on home dialysis than the U.S. And again, as uh, not quite as good as transplant, but all you know, there are better health outcomes associated with patients being at home, um, living longer and healthier lives, and also getting much more uh, able to be transplanted. So we really want to push the envelope and move patients to home. We're looking at just even patients starting home first. So the first goal speaks to the fact that uh, CMS would like to say see that 60% increase in incident patients that go to the home modality setting. So they never step their foot in the door to um, a dialysis center, they go straight into home and start doing their home care um, as their first line of treatment. And each year, the network is required to make a 10% increase in, that, uh, in the amount. So we're trying to kind of cumulatively reach that 60% by the end of the five years. I think there's a couple years where we have to get even 12 or 15% to kind of get up to 60. 
For prevalent patients, so these are patients who are currently um, receiving in-center dialysis, um, they would like to see an overall 30% of those patients then dialyzing in the home versus in-center. And um, we're looking at starting the year with a 2% increase. Again, for all the five years that we are working on this, there's some continuing escalation in the rate at which we want to go, but to finally reach that overall 30% increase in patients going to a home program. And then uh, this is another add on to the home program and they're really trying to stress the use of telemedicine to spread out access to home. So, you know, we've heard often that people who may live an hour or two away from a home program can't access that because, you know, it's just too far away. And we found that, you know, very successful intervention is that if a patient can be trained and, and you know, take the couple weeks that they need for training uh, to come into the center, um, then they do not have to return the, to the center except for once a quarter. So two of their three monthly office visits can be done using telemedicine. And um, we've actually talked to some really wonderful uh, facilities out there, different rural communities that are doing a really great job. And, you know, one lady shared with me the other day that, they actually had a snow event in North Carolina and they did all their clinic visits from home. So not only does it help their rural patients, but instead of missing clinic visits, they just converted everybody to a televisit for that day and, and got them done. So really great work um, using telemedicine. Um, so, you know, what we've done along the way, um, of course, we've optimized the NCC change packet, which Carolyn featured on her slides. Uh, we have a similar one for home. But some of the things that we really want to make sure everybody understands is how to document your patients in the EQRS system. Many times we find out people don't switch settings. They forget to, you know, permanently move the patient to a home setting and therefore they don't get counted for their great work. So we do spend a lot of time kind of trying to educate and teach on what you need to do to change um, and capture the right modality for the patients. Uh, we also have an extensive telehealth toolkit. So we've We've heard that a lot of the barriers are patients not being prepared and, and some technology barriers. And so we've got some really great tips to use. So that telehealth medicine um, toolkit is very robust. It actually has ideas about how to go through a clinic visit as well as you know, how to get connected, even some ideas about um, technology to use that may be easier for patients. So if you're struggling with telemedicine, we ask you to you know, look up the toolkit. Uh, we did just start offering and, you know, I really want to promote it. If you go to our IPRO Learn portal, you have to go in under your own individual ID. So you may have to create a login for an application. We all know how to do that. But if you do, you can log in and take the CE course. And we've, we really designed a course around, um, you know, why advocate for a home therapy for your patients. So this is directed to chair side staff who are working with prevalent patients. You know, and maybe this patient isn't the greatest candidate for home, you think, you know, maybe you think they won't be able to handle it. Um, but to really expand your mind and your expectations and try to work with the patients and encourage them. And, you know, we've got a lot of really great ideas about how all patients could be offered home and, and to really think through that and try to uh, seek as many candidates as you can, as well as all the benefits that patients experience when they um, go home. And then uh, we've also uh, promoted the use of this home dialysis central. It has a lot of stories from patients about this is a lady, you know, camping, obviously, and enjoying living life and being able to do what she wants because she now does her own dialysis and has her own schedule. So uh, Thrive on Dialysis is a great little group of vignettes about patients talking to patients about home. And then these are some of the actual tools that we mentioned. These are in the telehealth resource. Um, but here's that checklist. Here's a, a little idea about, you know, using telemedicine. We have um, some very um, simple tools that just help people decide between home dialysis and what the different options are. So we have a whole um, kind of complete genre of tools there that maybe you have a lot with your own facility, but maybe you're missing one or two pieces, like something that really is going to tighten up your telemedicine or something that you can use as a quick one pager to start talking about home. So um, we ask that you kind of look at our resources and IFR learn and use those, you know, when you can to help supplement whatever you're doing. And then this is something else that we um, really try to share with everybody. So 
you know, we have the rate that you are moving patients to a home modality. If you have a home program, we're going to track whether you can move incident patients to home because those would be patients that never even came into the center. If you're embedded in a dialysis facility and have a home program, we're going to do something like this show, slide shows where we have a report that shows which, how many patients you transitioned to home and how many new patients you started. And we have the numbers that you did last year and some goals that we would like you to meet this year. So in this particular example, the facility put six patients on from their prevalent population and four from their new patients. They had done this many um, trans, you know, movements, four patients moved to date, and they still needed to move another six to get to their, um, to get to their home goals. And we even kind of put the national and um, you know, um, network rates on here. And, this report is combined with transplant. So transplant numbers are on the same report. So we do kind of a modalities report for all of you to show how's your facility moving and what is it doing and how does it rank with the rest of the network and the national rate. So you can see in this particular situation, uh, the facility is at a 4.1 rate. The national rate to move patients to home um, from a prevalent center is 5.7. So they're a little behind. Uh, they are ahead when it comes to um, incidents. Transplants, uh, they're a little behind on actual transplanted patients, but getting patients to the wait list, they're kind of hitting the, the average. Um, oh, wait, I'm down here. I'm, I apologize. Their facility rates are down here. I don't have transplant ones, but transition, they're ahead, actually, and incident, they're behind. I said that backwards. I apologize. So here's the network state benchmarks, and here's what they're performing at below. And I have the great um, honor to introduce somebody who's doing an amazing job with home modalities. Her name is Ramona Billingsley. She um, works out of a clinic in um, Oxford, Ohio, and um, has a really great story and ideas to share to us about her experience with Feel the Difference, which is a program they're running out of the clinic. And um, she's just a delight to hear and a believer in home. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ramona and. Um, Thank you so much, Ramona, for participating today and sharing your great best practice with us. Well, um, we started or we did the rollout at the Hamilton Clinic. I'm at two clinics. So our the next stage um, started or we rolled out at the Hamilton facility. Oh, okay. And, and so um, with that, we went through our um, two weeks of training. Well, actually, um, Mincy and Carly um, came down and they trained six of us. Um, it was um, four nurses and two techs, um, myself and Christina Wilkerson. And um, so we did the training first so that we could, you know, set the machines up and get the um, get the feel for the machines before we presented it to the patients. We already knew that there were several that we chose ahead of time when we were in training that we thought would be really good candidates. And they turned out to be really, really great candidates. Um, so we have a station dedicated in the clinic and it is decorated. It looks like somebody's living room. So oh. <laughs> that's one thing, you know, so it is really nicely decorated back there. So our other patients see this nice little area over here and we're like, yeah, the only thing, you know, is missing is the fact that this is here and not at your house. This is how you can set this up for home. And um, so they come in, they, they have a later schedule, so they don't have to be here at 645 in the morning. We actually bring them in around 930. Um, and according to whatever their prescription is, is how long they will run on the machine. And you do see some of the other patients like, you know, why they're getting off so just so early. The 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 difference with the machine itself, it is they see the difference as far as this how small it is, how much room it's gonna actually take up in their house. Um so with with the initial when we have the conversation with the patient, we we let them know, hey, can you give me a two week, can you give me two weeks? You know, it's two weeks where they will commit to coming in four times a week. So we're adding a day to them. And and as 
I discussed earlier, transportation, you know, you know, you gotta figure out transportation because we are adding an extra day and how we did it here is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. So that's how they ran and we did it that way so that they wouldn't become fluid overload um, before they had to come back to us. You can go to the next slide, please. So with our first person, our first patient we had, um, she was sticking herself. We had taught her how to cannulate. So she was self cannulating. And by the time we sent her to home therapies, she was sticking herself. The only thing we did was set the machine up for her. Um, she did give us the two weeks. By the second treatment, she was meeting her husband in the parking lot at the car. This is a person that could not go from the facility to the front door, literally. So her husband would have to pull the car up to, to pick her up. And second treatment, she surprised herself by showing up at the car. And he was like, did you walk over here? That's just how good she felt literally at her second treatment. So she did her two weeks and she came back to see us not too long ago. And not only do she look amazing, but she's down three blood pressure medications. So when we say we're pushing this, it literally is we are pushing this because they do feel so much better. They literally within the second treatment and you have to see it is so not an exaggeration. By the time they're done with their first week, they don't know what to do with themselves. And they are literally looking forward to getting that second week over with so that they can go and transition into the home, you know, and just start training on how to set their machines up and do their machines at the house. So next slide, please. So I already talked about the first patient, the second patient, um, we didn't think she would be a good candidate. Honest to goodness, we didn't think she would be a good candidate. Um, there was some, you know, issues with, you know, hygiene and cleanliness, you know, as far as the whole dog grooming business in the house. Um, not only just the dog grooming business, but just people coming back, you know, it's it, in and out. And so we're not going to deny anyone. So our thing is just like transplant. We'll refer anyone. We'll let the transplant decide whether. So we said, hey, let's go ahead. Let's do the two weeks and we'll take it from there. And I, even home therapies was like, she turned out to be amazing. Like it literally turned out to be amazing. She keeps everything clean. She's been doing a really, really good job as far as just being at home and, and, and she's, she's, successful, which I thought within two weeks she would be back. And so when I see her, I will let her know. I apologize. I, hats off to you. I'm so proud of you. So we had a person here um, that was going to give us the two weeks, but she had a lot of things happen that she only actually did two days. And she still is talking about how good she felt in those two days. So when her life calms down a little bit more, we're going to revisit her, but in our initial rollout, we had four successful patients transition to home. And we are right now um, getting ready to expand and go into uh, have 3 more uh, machines. So we're going to have a where they actually do the. In house training, so home is going to take over that part. But for the most part, we. Um, we're still educating the patients and we're still letting them know that, you know, this is an option for them and, and all they have to do is literally give us two weeks to see how they would feel. Is that my final slide? Okay, so what we do here is not train the patients. We do not train the patients. We give them two weeks of experiencing how they would feel if they did more frequent dialysis at home and they would do it at a, so right now they do three days a week, anywhere from four to four and a half hours. If you're doing 
dialysis more frequently at home, you don't have to do the four and a half hours. It's a little bit more gentler on them. And so we're letting them know this is a whole lot gentler on you. You create your own schedule. And by adding that extra day, it you would not believe how well you feel. I'm very passionate about this. I have several family members that are on dialysis that I'm literally trying to get out the clinic. Two are being worked up for transplant because they're they're young, but I'm like, you all are not stuck in these chairs. So this is all for me. I I I all I'm all in on this because like I said, I have several family members that are dialysis patients. And all the information that I I acquire, I share with them and I'm letting them know like, hey, you all too young for this. You all do not need to be stuck in these chairs. So we are in the process of trying to get a couple of them right now to experience the difference so that they can see for themselves how well they would feel. Um, and so between that and my patients here, we are definitely you know, doing some next stage education. I'm doing next stage education at the other facility that I, that I go to in Oxford. So we have several patients that are willing to come down but again, that too is a transportation issue because they're coming from Oxford to Fairfield to train. So I'm like, if you can give me two weeks. So we're also talking with our social worker to help with transportation as far as helping to set up transportation for some of these people that can't get back and forth. I also asked if there is a um, program to where they can be reimbursed for their, um, their gas. Because I know before they were given, they used to give out gas cards to family members that um, was bringing their loved ones back and forth. So they were going to look into that. And I think that came from the National Kidney Foundation. So they're looking into it because we're trying to uh, get the patients to the training. I never heard about your, it looks like a, when we were talking about like a living room, that's a really great idea too. You have like carpet down in the whole bed or what? No, because you know, the floors, you got to bop them and everything, okay. but we have curtains up. We have, um, so there's curtains up, there's pillows, there's um, a, a little uh, stand that has, you know, ETD on there. I mean, I will literally have to take some pictures. It is so nice. It looks so nice over in that corner. So we have a dedicated, uh, experience the difference corner where, you know, it literally looks like somebody's living room and all it's missing is literally an easy chair. But of course, with blood and stuff, we, we need the dialysis chair so we can wipe it down. Uh -huh. But um, yes, and we're not the only ones. They, uh, most of the facilities have, uh, have it set up to look like a living room. Some are better than others. Mine's is better. Uh, <laughs> Get some interior design help, huh? <laughs> but yeah, but so we when we start when they initiate it, so I know like Kenwood and all the, the facilities that are around here that, that has it, we have it set up so it looks just like you know their home, so that they can see this is how it would look. This is exactly the machine you would have, the base and everything. They see just how much room they, they would need. And and they also see that it's not that big. It's not that big. We also let them know they can travel with it. It flies for free. They will give them a hard case to put their machine in if they're flying. If they're driving, they get a roll case. We do let them know it takes two people to pick it up, but you know, it is transportable. The um, they have it set up with FedEx that they will ship out their supplies, so they don't have to have a whole trunk full of supplies. It is shipped out for free. The machine flies free and they have, like I said, a hard case for the, for the plane. And they also have a, a roll cart for your car. So, like, I, I tell them all the time, you all are not stuck in this facility at all. This machine travels, your supplies travel. All you have to do is pick a destination. So are they, Ramon, are they evaluated for like PD first and then if they're not a candidate, they go to feel the difference or it just depends on what they indicate they'd like to do from a home perspective or how does that work? 
Well, for here, um, if they, if some of them are not candidates for PD, some of them don't want to do PD. Okay. So, you know, they have options as far as when they start the TOPS program where they tell them what, what they can have um, as far as, you know, their treatment options. So they are aware of the PD um, and they're aware of like PD catheters and all that stuff. Um, so they're aware of it. And it's up to the patient as to if they want a PD catheter or if they want to do this, because we have a lot of patients that don't like the idea of sticking themselves, you know, and I have patients whose family members don't like the thought of blood, you know, you know what I mean? In the house. So those are all, those are obstacles too, that we have to discuss. I have a patient that is, um, she has some vision issues due to her diabetes. She would love to do experience the difference, but her family won't help her. Like they will not help her set up the machine. And so we are exploring options of maybe like even a home health nurse to, um, because she can't see the program it, you know, and as big as everything is, she still can't see the program it. So I'm like, we can see if we can get someone in to just set the machine up, program it, and then she will have her iPad um, if she has some issues, they, they all are, they all come with an iPad that they can, you know, chat with someone if they have issues while they're on the machine. I'm very disappointed in her family as far as them not wanting to see her out of the facility. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, and her dad had a transplant, so he knows, he knows. So we're still working on that. We're working on, you know, how we can get her some help in the house. So that she can actually do this at home. Yeah, I really love all your great ideas to kind of overcome barriers and it seems it, just in talking with you. It feels like you pre would you say before you saw this and saw how patients did you were as passionate about home or are you. Or did this like just throw you over the top and, and now you're advocating it all the time. 2 years ago, we got to go down to the next stage facility. We, they actually had a, a, a next stage facility. Um, Arsenius ended up buying it out, but we actually got to go down there and and we got to practice on how to put it together. And I watched the the videos and stuff. So I've been waiting on this for like two years <laughs> because I I I was I was excited about it then, and I was like, when it comes up here, I want to be you know one of the champions. And Darlene was like, no problem. She's like, that makes me not have to worry about a volunteer. So to me, I was already you know on board. And now we get to actually set the machines up. We do, you know, I'm like two weeks. Let me know how you feel. If you don't, I mean, if you don't feel better or worse or what have you, you haven't lost anything. You still have to come, you know. So it's not like we're asking you to to do something that you wasn't normally going to do. We are asking that you give us an extra day. So, you know, and we, and so Darlene then put the orders in. We do have to get an order for an extra treatment. You know, because they will be getting four treatments, you know, for that two weeks. They'll, so they'll get four treatments in that first week, four treatments in the second week, and then they transition. We transfer them to Fairfield to the home program where they do their training. That sounds great. And it sounds like most people end up going home. So you only have your couple that back out. So it obviously works when they get to try it and see and, and have a nice, their nice little living room setting. I don't think um, there's any other questions in the queue. Did you see anything, Carolyn? No. Anyone? I don't see questions? any. For either speaker, I think we still have Aaron on. So for Aaron or um, Ramona. No questions in the chat, but maybe somebody will be stimulated and send us a question and we'll forward it to you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Aaron. It was very great presentation. Yeah, I'm very welcome. Thank you. You're we always welcome. learned so much from you guys. And we really appreciate you coming on. And this is, you know, just happening in our area. So please, everybody out there, you know, if you have questions or ideas, shoot them to us. We appreciate everyone attending and listening to these great best practices and um, always beneficial to hear when somebody's doing some great work out there. And uh, 
We will um, have a little evaluation at the end of the call, so please stay on and fill that out for us. We will send you these slides if you've registered, so you will get a copy of the information, as well as this will be posted on our April Learn Quality Improvement Hub. So um, thanks again. Great presentations, everyone. Keep up the great work, and uh, let's get people home or transplanted, right? Hey, Vic, I do have one question, though, that says um, Ramona said that they are giving out gas cards. Can she tell us more? So before we drop off, if, if, if we Oh, well, I said previously, the social workers were able to apply for gas cards from the National Kidney Foundation. We now keep in mind, all right, today is my 24th year here. So we've seen a lot of things come and go. And so I was, what I said was that I was going to get in touch with our social worker to see if that was still an option. Because we used to do that. They literally used to apply for gas cards for family members. And they would, we also got like um, Kroger gift cards for them as well. So it all depends on what the Kidney Foundation is doing this year for you know what? So, and and this it is a first come first serve. They do have to apply for this. Um, so it's not something that they do right away. It is something that they apply for. Another really valuable resource for transportation is the United Way two one one website, and that website, if you put in the patient's address or zip code, will list the amount of uh, the available assistance to the patient. So, for example, if they are going to drive and you give up food money to get your gas money, they might be able to have benefits in their area that would support them in their journey to home or to their transplant visit. Thank you. I did write that down. I did wait 211. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, it's been a great session. We really appreciate everybody's input and, and uh, sharing. And uh, please stay on for the survey, and we will um, send this out shortly. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye.